put the bug, bug in this shell script. You have 30 seconds. Let people think, right? So time up, if you don't, if you cannot find the bug, it's fine. I'll get back to this code later in this talk. So let's set expectations. So what you should expect from this talk. So I'm going to talk about static analysis as a service. Uh, I'll look at, uh, I'll look at static analysis from the service side of things, from a high level. And I'll talk about the history of OpenScan Hub. I'll talk about the process of open, uh, open sourcing. Why, why use static analysis? How to integrate, uh, which other services are integrated with. And I, I'll try to keep this talk simple. Like stat static analysis is hard. So I'll not go into the depth of the problem or depth of static analysis. I'll cover the idea from a very high level. I'll keep it simple. And I'll take questions at then if we have time left. So my name is Siteshwar. I work for Red Hat. I'm a package maintainer in the RHEL group. I've been involved in a number of projects in the past, some of them listed here, and currently I'm one of the active contributors in the OpenScan Hub project. So before I talk about OpenScan Hub, let me define static analysis. So what is static analysis? Static analysis is the analysis of computer programs performed without executing them. So you have your source code, you have a tool for static analysis, you give the source code to the tool and it, it will tell you the bugs that may be there in the source code. And the idea is not new. Some of you may be using this in one or the other way in, in, with your projects. Uh, some of the tools listed here are, are static analysis tools, CPP check, shell check, uh, GCC, Clang, Clippy. Clippy is the tool for Rust, for those of you who don't know. Uh, Coverity, uh, the best of them all, and also proprietary. Uh, so what is the problem that we are trying to solve? The problem is fragmentation. What do, what do I mean by that? So what is the problem? So each of these tools that I mentioned in the previous slide are different tools. They are de developed independent of each other. Uh, they have a different target audience. For example, shell check is towards shells. CPP check is towards C++. Coverity is mo more general. And either there are different communities or companies behind some of the tools I listed there. So. Let's talk about the service idea. So build a service that can run all the all these some of these analyzers on your code base and make it easy to collect all the reports at a single place and make it easy to analyze the reports. So how does it look? So you have a service, web service to be specific. Uh, you have a user, user requests a scan to the service. The service runs various analyzers on the code base and gives the result back to the, back to the user. So that's, that's the core idea. The rest of my talk will revolve around this idea. And the idea existed in Red Hat for more than a decade. So, and the idea had a name. The name was CoScan. So what was CoScan? CoScan was a project that started in 2011. It was a service for static and dynamic analysis. Uh, since RHEL 7, we have been performing mass scans on, before new re releases of RHEL and on, on updates. Uh, so this was the service we were using. And one of the key features of CoScan was differential scans. I will get back to differential scans later in this talk. And as you can see in the name, the name CoScan, it used Coverity as one of the primary backends. And when, when I look at the name CoScan, this is the code that comes to my mind. One of the hardest things in computer science is naming. Why do I say so? Because CoScan was not Coverity. And other than Coverity, we were also using uh, open source tools like CPP check, shell check, GCC, and Clang, static analyzers embedded in GCC and Clang, uh, fine Unicode control, and CoScan also had the ability to uh, use other tools on demand. And so how do you get over the naming confusion? 
you, you rename the project. You spend more than a decade trying to tell people that course can, is not coverity. But because, because, just because of the name, people always confuse course can with coverity. So we decided to rename the project. We decided to call it Open Scan Hub. So for those of you who work at Red Hat and know the name CoScan, CoScan is, CoScan is actually OpenScan up, or OpenScan up is CoScan. So we decided, just decided to open source this code base in mid-2022. We started somewhere around June, Ju July 2022 and we agreed to call this project OpenScan up. We spent quite some time thinking about the name. And uh, in mid-2023, uh, we became open source. Uh, by open source, I mean we moved to GitHub. Everything that we were doing internally, we, were, we, uh, we started doing it publicly on GitHub. And let me talk about another misconception. The misconception is people think open sourcing is easy. And so what are the requirements for a project to become open source? The requirements are that development should happen in public. That looks easy. Put a license on the code. As long as people agree on the license, it should not be an issue. Now, you have to rename everything. So everything that, that uh, all the occurrences of course can had to be changed to open scan up. So we had to rename almost everything in the code. Now the natural instinct at this point is that you decide to fork. And when I talk about fork, I'm talking about a long-term fork. So course scan and open scan up split their ways. Course scan remains internal, open scan up becomes public. And uh, basically, the internal st stuff is kept different from the external, external stuff. But we decided not to take that approach. And because we have a handful of people involved in the project, all of us agreed that we should do everything in the same repository. Do not, for do not create a long-term fork. And do not break anything. So this is where it gets complicated. Because the service has a long history of deployment, we cannot break anything internally. So we have to basically rename everything without breaking the internal deployment. And how do you do that? How do you avoid breaking stuff? You build a CI, and we build the CI twice, internally on GitLab and externally through GitHub. And CI is useless if you don't have tests, so you write tests. So what are the steps we follow to open source the code base? So step number one is you write tests. Add them to the CI. Rename some code, just a little bit of it. Test in CI, test in staging, test in non-production deployment. Now test in production. And go back to step one until the project is fully renamed. So we spent like close to one year following all these steps. Uh, now once the project is fully renamed, you put a license file in the code, put the source code in public, and develop everything publicly. So that's largely what happened for, for a year. And these steps are oversimplified. Use your common sense if you see anything missing. It's how to simplify everything here. But this is largely what happened, these 10 steps. And we finally became open source in June 2023. Uh, so what is OpenScan Hub? OpenScan Hub is static analysis as a service. It's open source. We use GPLv3 as, as the license. It can scan any type of code, not limited to any programming language. So one of the key features of OpenScanUp is the ability to do differential scans. So what is a differential scan? So you have a source code, of, uh, you have older version of the package, you have newer version of the package, you perform a differential scan, and the differential scan will tell you the, intro, uh, the defects that are introduced in the newer version. So it will skip all the defects that are there in the older version. And it's extens extensible through CSMOC plugin, and it can collect all reports at a single place. That is a hub. Now let me tell you a famous acronym for such a service. The famous acronym is SAST, Static Application Security Testing. So some of the, we don't differentiate between security and non-security issues, but some of the bugs that are found through open scan up may be security issue, but maybe security issue issue. So, but it can also found known security issue too. Maybe some, something that may not be security issue, but maybe a real bug. And so after, after any year, uh, I made a blog post. Uh, the idea that I'm talking about here today, 
I summarized all these ideas in this blog post. And in August 2023, I made this blog post and I posted this on Reddit. And that's the response I got from Reddit. My post was removed from the moderators. And the reason was this. It's not relevant to Linux or low effort. That's how people look at things. None of them is true. Now, I didn't get any attention on social media. But let me talk about a bug that was very famous on social media. And the bug happened in 2014, and it was found in RHEL 6. So what was the bug? The bug was uh, restarting Squid was wiping, up, wiping out everything from local storage. So you can read more about this bug at, at the link that is given at the bottom. It was quite famous. And so why did I show you this bug? I showed you because this bug was actually found in the, found in the de development version of RHEL. To be more specific, it was L6.7. Uh, it was found by a human. To be more specific, a QE found it. And it can be easily detected through static analysis tools. Now, this is the question I asked you at the beginning of the talk. Do you see the bug now? So, yeah. So, if the value of Squid PID file DIR variable is empty, it will wipe out everything from the from the storage. And if you run this code through shell check, you will get this report. It will tell you that it may happen, something like that. So you will see it in the setting analysis reports. Now, when something like this happens, the developer wrote, the developer who wrote that code has a very hard time. Uh, but sometimes the problem doesn't lie with the people, it lies with the processes. Uh, this is a quote from book, The Field Guide to Understanding Human Error. It talks about human side of technology failures. And the quote goes this way. Underneath every simple, obvious story about human error, there's a deeper, more complex story about the organization. And when I say organization, think of a Linux distribution. Uh, so how a Linux distribution is built? So the code comes from the upstream. Uh, for example, Linux kernel, systemd bash. Think of your favorite project here. And so the upstream code gets to the user through a distribution. In the case of Red Hat, the distribution is Fedora. So Fedora contains RPM packages of upstream code. And some of the code that is there in Fedora gets into RHEL. RHEL is towards the enterprise use case. Slower but more stable. So in simple, simple words, code flows from upstream to downstream. Now, what are the problems uh, with that flow? So the upstream code I'm talking about, upstream projects, they are like thousands of them, and they're all, all independent of each other. Uh, the second point is true for the, especially for legacy code bases. Uh, some, of, some of those projects may contain a large amount of defects, uh, because all the communities are independent of each other. We don't control the processes, programming language, or technologies they may be using. And even if they are using the same programming language, they may be using different coding style. And as the project grows, the, the, number, the number of people involved in the project also grow. So there won't be a single person who know everything. And this situation gets worse when people start leaving the project. So, how do you deal with this situation? Let me talk about an idea here, quite famous lately. The idea is called shift left. So what is shift left? Shift left testing is an approach to software testing and system testing in which testing is performed earlier in the life cycle. How does it relate to a distribution? So in simple words, you move testing closer, closer to upstream. Either you do it in Fedora or you do, you do it, try to push it towards the upstream. And some of the projects that can help us are listed here. Packet, Fedora, CI, they are targeted more towards upstream. Now, so what are the next goals? The project is open source, so what are our next goals? The next goals are, we would like to move testing to Fedora and other upstream communities. Before that, we have to deploy publicly. Like, we only had an internal deployment. We never had a public deployment. So you deploy on the Fedora infra, ideally, make, make the deployment public. And before that, you need to scale. Now, Let's talk about what, why, and how of scale. 
when I talk, talk about scale, what do, what do I mean by scale? And so let's, let's look at the architecture of OpenScan from service side. How does it work? So the central part of OpenScan Hub is uh, it's a Django application. We call it Hub in our terms. So the Hub can receive requests from clients from multiple places, and it will accept the request. And but the actual scans are not performed by the Hub. They are performed by workers. Static scans is very resource expensive, so you cannot do everything on a single node. So you you basically need to have workers that will do the actual heavy lifting, do the actual static analysis. One of the workers will pick up the task from the hub, they will report back the results, and the hub will store the information in a database and in file system storage. So database contains the meta information about a scan and file system storage has the actual results. Let me answer the what, what question now. What do, I, what do I mean by scale? In OpenScan Hub, in this context, scale is defined by the number of workers because they are the one taking the resources, most of them. So let me throw this question to you. How many SRPMs are there in rel Nine? Take a guess. Close. Thirty-five thousand. Um, that's quite off. So, so the answer is 2726. So let me talk about the past year. So the, the Rel9 has, these are the officially supported ones, that's, that's what I'm saying. So as Rel9 had, has more than 2700, Rel8 had more than 3000, 3300, and Rel7 had more than 1500. And the reason I'm showing you these numbers are because when we were doing the mass scans on RHEL, the number of workers that we used ranged anything between 6 to 16. And all of, the, all of them were pre-allocated. They were static. Now, let me throw another question to you. How many SRPMs are there in Fedora 41? Oh. Any guesses? Any other guesses? Okay, so the answer is more close to 24,000. And before Fedora people start complaining, this is the query I used. And the last time I ran this query, that's the number I got. So the number may change over time because Fedora moves very fast. So how Fedora is different from RHEL? So Fedora is, it contains more packages, like close to 10 times more packages in Fedora. There may be variance in loads on service because the load on the service depends on the activity from the community. And then you cannot trust all the sources. There are, there are hostile elements in every community. So they may, be, they may be trying to compromise the workers and influence the results. How do you deal with this situation? You spin up single use workers on demand. You keep the workers disposable and use them only for one scan. And when the scan finishes, you destroy the worker. Uh, so the next question is how, how do we do that? So let me talk about Resolock here. What is Resolock? So Resolock is a project that is targeted, uh, that is used to allocate and manage expensive resources like virtual machines, and it's used by the copper team to spin up builders. So builder is the term used by the copper team for workers, the, the machines that build the RPMs. Uh, and the case that we have of scaling on demand, this, this case is supported through a subcomponent of Resolock. It's called Resolock Agent Spanner. And you can read more about Resolock at the bottom of the slide the link that I gave, um, the, the link that is there at the bottom of the slide. So how does it work? So we, don't, we do not uh, steadily, uh, we do not pre-allocate the workers. So, so what we do is that we have put Resolock in our deployment. So Resolock checks from the hub. Or do you need any workers? And if hub requests for workers, Resolock will spin up a new worker. The worker will pick up the task from hub and give the result back. And workers are only created when they are tasks. And they are destroyed when the task finishes. So if you have zero tasks, you will get zero workers. How, how, how is that important? So one, the most important part is the cost. Because we are spinning up workers on AWS, we do not want to have static workers because we do not want to have any workers when there are no tasks pending. So it directly impacts the cost. It shows up on the bill. 
Second thing is security. Because a, a, a worker is only used once, it cannot be reused. So even if the worker gets compromised, it, you cannot have influence on the other scans. And the third thing is scale. Because we are using Resolook, we gain the ability to go from zero to hundreds of workers within a matter of minutes. So that's good. And we finally moved to production uh, in Fedora uh, earlier this year. And the link for this service is given at the bottom of the slide. And that's how it looks. It looks like rather simple, but the service is quite, po quite powerful. So the next question is how, how to use it. And you can use the scan submission form given at the bottom of the page. You, ne you need a fast account to submit a scan. So you need to log in and submit a, uh, you can submit a scan from, from this link. The other way to use it through the CLI, command line interface. So we have the name of the tool that is used to submit scans is called OSS CLI. Uh, and this is the command to perform a full scan. So you can use OSS CLI mock build and it will, it will perform a full scan on the package. And if you want to perform a differential build, uh, you can use this command. And it will tell you the defects that are introduced in the newer versions. And use it especially for legacy code bases. You may want to only focus on the defects that are introduced in a newer version of a legacy code base. And if you're a downstream maintainer, you can use the diff build command. And what it will do is that it will tell you the defects that are there in the downstream patches. Uh, so you can only focus on the downstream defects. And there's instructions to use this uh, tool is given at the Fedora wiki. That's the link. Everything is documented there. Uh, but ideally, you want to run these scans automatically. So what are the integ integration points for this service? The integration points are the Fedora CI, the packet project, and mass scans. Now let me talk about each of them individually. Let me talk about mass scans first. So what is a mass scan? So mass scan, you select a number of packages, large set of packages, and you perform a scan on them. And it's usually performed periodic periodically, and usually you start it manually. And it makes sense to perform such scans in the early development cycle of a release. For example, in case of Fedora, it makes sense to run them on raw head so that you can focus on fixing defects early. And one of the, the first mass scan was performed in April this year. And this is how it looks. The, the, uh, the report was, was shared with the community. The link is given at the bottom. It was shared on Fedora Devil. Uh, so let's look at some numbers. If you're not looked at this report, please look at it. So let's look at some numbers. The numbers are. Uh, so, this, we chose only close to 100 packages from core critical path packages list, uh, and 96 scans were successful. Some of them failed because of build failures, package build failures, not scan failures. And uh, we identified, like, it, it's the report from full scan, like, we identified more than 14,000 defects. Not all, all the Possible bugs may be actual bugs or maybe secu or security issues, but some of them may be real bugs or even security issues. So please look at the report carefully. And there will, there will be more scans coming in the future based on the agreement we, we, have, we have with the Fedora team. So let me talk about Packet now. So for those of, of you who don't know Packet, Packet is a service that is aimed towards making it easy to build RPM packages for the distros that are listed here. And the packet command line tool already supports submitting a, submitting a scan. So if you already use packet, you can use this subcommand, packet scan in OSH. It will perform a full scan on, on the package. And if you want to perform a differential scan, you can, use, you can specify the base SRPM option and perform a differential scan. And ideally, we should be running these scans automatically. So we are currently in discussion with the packet team how to do the differential scans automatically. Uh, the last one is Fedora CI. So what is Fedora CI? Fedora CI is continu continuous integration infrastructure for Fedora. And ideally, we should be running differential scans on pull requests. That should happen somewhere in the future. Uh, so what are the key takeaways from this talk? The key takeaways are, if you don't use static analysis tools, please use them. 
And if you already use them, maybe try to use OpenScan up. You can run, you can use different analyzers with the service. And especially use static analysis if you have legacy code bases, or more specifically, use differential scans. And I will end this talk with a confession, sort of confession. This, this is a bug where I was involved. And you can read the full report here in the, in the link that is given at the bottom of the slide. So there was a regression in Bash. So audit logs were broken. So we have a feature where it's a downstream feature where user types the command and everything is logged in audit logs. And this feature was broken in, due to a regression, it was broken in rel 8 and rel 9. And the reason I show you that report, uh, that bug, is because that bug was actually coded by static analysis tools uh, when we were running mass scans on, on RHEL 8. And the year was 2018. Uh, this function, function was defined but not used. But this bug was actually not introduced in RHEL 8. It was introduced in Fedora. It was caused by accident code, code deletion. And I did not introduce this bug. I missed the report in the previous slide, but the bug was actually introduced by previous maintainer during the rebase to bash 4.3. And the year was 2014. Now do you see the full, full cycle here? So a bug that was introduced in 2014, missed by me in 2018, eventually found and fixed in 2024. So it's found, finally fixed in Fedora, Rel 8, and Rel 9. But do you see the problem here? The person who made the change is different from the person who was actually reviewing the reports. How do you deal with this situation? Like, how do you avoid something like this happening in the future? You shift left. You move static analysis closer to upstream. Everything that, all the testing that we perform in real, it should be performed closer to upstream. Uh, and this is my last slide. And I will end this quote. I'll end this uh, talk with a quote from book Behind Human Error. It talks about the human side of technology failures. Similar book like the quote I made previously. So the quote goes this way. If an organization, organization is not able to change its model of itself unless and until completely clear evidence accumulates, that organization will tend to learn late. That is, it will revise its model of vulnerabilities only after serious events occur. Your code may not be as stable or secure as you may think. Thank you for listening. Are there any questions? You want? Okay. So, so one question for your um, scanning. Um, I'm using Coverty uh, in 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 my, in my work uh, as an Red Hat employee. How do you um, like enable or allow the users to specify models for some functions which we do not want to or Coverty cannot understand, and we can write a model. So we have a model for some functions uh, and. That needs to be built separately and passed to the coverage scan as an Don't extra model. I think you're so, the right person. So the, the first thing is that uh, there is no coverage in the publicly available instance. Oh. So we only use the open source uh, static analyzers. But uh, th there is uh, a feature where you can upload a model file for coverage. And I think this can be used also for the open source static analyzers if they support it. I think for I think for C and C++ the most useful static analyzer these days is the GCC analyzer, which is still actively developed and it uh, becomes better and better. And uh, but, but it, on the other hand, it is still experimental, so it may happen that it crashes or that it runs forever. So you do not want to run it in your production builds. So what OpenScanHub does is that it runs the GCC analyzer in a separate process with a strict timeout. So you always get the results in a predictable amount of time. Okay, thank you. There's a question at the back. 
Should I pass the mic? Yes. But like, what do you see to like the uh, roadblocks, like the current uh, issues to moving it all the way to the upstream? Because like, it doesn't seem like upstream can use, use it directly. It seems like it needs to be packaged first, and then you can do the scan. So the question is that how, what are the problems of shifting left, yeah. shifting left the idea towards the community or all upstream? The way, all the way to the left, all the way to I think the biggest problem is ignorance. People just ignore these reports. So, for example, when I shared the report of the mask and with the, with the community, I saw no response, close to no response. The idea is somewhat new. Like, people don't know. They see it, very, at, it as a very mathematical thing, you know, static analysis. The idea is somewhat new to them. I mean, they use it through coverity, but the idea of entirely scanning a Linux distribution and, you know, pushing the idea towards, shift, uh, towards the left, it's somewhat new. Like I don't know of any other distribution than RHEL, which which has that idea of fully analyzing the. It's just ignorance. So basically, that's that's my answer. So we need to. That's why I'm giving this talk, so that people get to know the idea. But what about the upstream projects that want to use? So we want we want to use things like packet because we cannot force them to use the, that. Okay, but everything that is there in upstream gets into Fedora. Right, so we do, you do the mask scans on Fedora, or you do it through Fedora CI, or you do it through Packet. So we we control that part, but we do not control the fully. I mean, it's their choice. They may or may not use it. So does that answer the question? So yeah, you, you can just speak, and I will repeat the question. I mean, that's why I was focusing on the differential scans. So because the question? Oh, the question is, uh, there may be many false positives in the reports. That's why I, I want to focus on differential scans. So don't, you can do the full scan, but just focus on the differential scan. So focus only the defects that. I mean, it can be a Kamil, do you want to follow up on that? Because we, we have solved that problem internally, but the code is... I think that, that, that should not happen in most of the cases, because uh, you usually do small changes of the code in, in the upstream pull request, and you will only be not notified by, about the problems that you introduce by the code changes. So th this is the only thing that you are asked to review. So I think this should help significantly because even even though you have 10,000 uh, potential bugs in your project and you are changing one line of code in in the project, you you, the, you will be only notified about problems that you introduced by the one line of changed code. Yes, in the end, there still needs to be someone to review the the potential findings from the static analyzers. Unless you are able to use AI for it or, or something, but that's currently not supported by OpenScan Hub. Yes, but uh, that, that's a good point, but we don't have anything better right now. So what, what we can do is to provide the automation for upstream developers so that they do not waste time by, by automating the scanning. But uh, yes, the scanners have technical limitations that, that are still there. And OpenScan Hub does not solve it for them, except the differential scans. <laughs>